There is nothing in this world that can satisfy. There is no satisfaction in all that you have created, Lord. You are our satisfaction. You are our joy. You are our peace. You are our sanctification. You are our redemption. You are our righteousness. You are our wisdom, our power, our glory. That is why God said to Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. To have you is to have all. To know you is to know everything. We are here tonight. We are here in your presence. We are here because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross of Calvary. By which we are redeemed unto our Father. We come to pay homage to you. We come to let you know that you are the reason. We are alive today. We thank you for all that you do. Just like the songwriter says, we're not thanking you really because of what we have done, but because of who you are. You're an amazing father, an amazing Lord, an amazing Jesus. Your glory is amazing. Your power is amazing. We thank you for counting us worthy and calling us into the banquet of your love. Thank you. In eternity, we will not be able to thank you enough, Lord. We glorify your name. What shall we say to you, wonderful Holy Spirit? A friend indeed, a friend in need. In our ups and downs, you have been there, Lord. We appreciate you, wonderful Holy Spirit, the spirit of grace, the spirit of truth, the spirit of glory, our helper. We thank you. We bless your name. Thank you for everyone that have gathered tonight to sit at your feet, to hear you again speak the word of life, the word that is able to build us up and offer us our inheritance among them that are sanctified. Thank you for those who are watching from different places online. Thank you for reaching out to every one of us. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for the life you are changing, the life you are transforming, the life that you are conforming into your very own image, Lord. We will not be able to thank you enough. But from the depth of our heart, we say, thank you. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter number one. And we read from verses 
26 through to 30. And God said, God said, the God that created the heavens and the earth, the God of the whole universe, the God that gave you life, the God that suspends the whole world, this world, the whole entire world is suspended by the power of his word. This whole creation, this whole world is hanging in his space. I know you think it's ground you can stand on, but beneath the ground is emptiness, down, down. This whole world is hanging at the power of this world. That's why the songwriter said, This kind God, I never see your kind. This kind, God, the doors are amazing. God is just, God is something else. That is why there is no searching of his power. There is no end to his wisdom. There is no searching of his understanding. He's too deep. And that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This is what God said. And he said, let them have dominion. Dominion over what? Over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful. Multiply, subdue, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given everything, every green herb, for meat. And it was so. It was just as God has said it. This scripture that I have read is the beginning and the end of God's purpose, of God's plan for man that he created. And I pray you pay very great attention God created man 
in his image and likeness so that he can have dominion through fruit bearing. I want to say again, God created man in his image and likeness so that he can have dominion through fruit bearing. It is through fruit bearing that you exercise dominion. Verse 28. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea. And God blessed them and God said to them, Multiply, replenish the earth, subdue the earth and have dominion. God created man in his image and likeness so that he can exercise dominion over all that he is created through bearing fruits. Even after the, that world, the first world was destroyed in the days of Noah, God started another war. He spared Noah and his family to begin another generation. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful. In order to continue the dominion that God has given to man, God created man in order to have dominion. And then he now said, be fruitful. It is through bearing fruit, fruit bearing. When you bear fruit, you multiply, you replenish it. You, that is how you subdue. That's how you take charge. That is how you reign in life with Christ. This is the mandate that God has given to every man that is created on earth. And there is, there is nothing you can do about it. It's established. Now, when he created man and said, be fruitful, and multiply. You cannot bear fruit without a seed. Without seed, there will be no fruit because the seed is the one that produces the fruit. That is why he said in verse 29 of Genesis chapter 1, in verse 29 he said, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. There is a seed with which you bear fruit. So to every animal, there is a seed in that animal. To every plant, there is a seed in that plant. To every man, there is a seed in the man with which you are going to do what? Multiply. So, it is the responsibility of man to do what? To nurture and cultivate that seed in order for it to produce fruit. If you do not nurture the seed and cultivate it, you're not going to see fruit. First Corinthians chapter 3 um, verse 
I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God which giveth the what? The increase. Now, he that planted and he that watereth are one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So, the planting and the watering. So, the seed need to be planted. The seed need to be watered. The seed need to be cultivated, nurtured, so that it will grow and produce fruits. God has given every man, every woman here, the ability to grow, to succeed in life. And it has been decreed. Nobody can undecree it. Nobody can change it. Nobody can alter it. Not even Satan. Not even the God of this world. Not even the power that seems to be. Nobody but nobody can change what God has said. So what it means is that your success, the fulfillment of your life, the success of your life, is not dependent on any other person but you. God has decreed. God said, let us make John. Let us make Emmanuel. Let us make Ebuka. Let us make Stephen, whoever, in our own image. And let them have dominion. And God blessed them and said... Be fruitful. Nobody, no other being, no other person, no government, no amount of antichrist, nobody but nobody can unsay what God has said. Nobody can cause you to be barren. That person doesn't have that power. Everything is designed and put together by God. So being able to know Understand that the, everything that you need to succeed, everything that you need to blow, everything that you need to become beyond your imagination, God has put them inside of you. It's God that gave the seed. It's in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he said, he that give it, 9, 8, he said, he that give it seed to the sower. It is God that gives seed. It's God that created you. It's God that put that seed in you. He expects fruit from you. He said, go have dominion. And the way you're going to have dominion is through bearing fruit. And you cannot bear fruit without a seed. So he put the seed inside of you and command you to bear fruit. And if God has said it, no circumstances, situations, atmospheres, location, wherever, you can never. Nobody has right. Nobody has the power. Nobody has the authority to stop you from bearing fruit, from reigning a life. So every man has been endowed with, by his creator, God who is no respecter of any person. God is not respecter of any person. Without partiality, you have what it takes. You see, fruit bearing, when you bear fruits, okay, when your life begins to produce fruits, when you begin to bear fruits, that is what makes you look like God. It is in fruitfulness. That is why he said, if you want to honor God and glorify him, he said, you are the light of the world. He said, let your light shine 
so that men can see the fruits, your good works, and then they will give glory. So the glory that God takes is when he sees you bearing fruit because your fruit represents who he is. In John chapter 15 verse 8, he said, in John 15, he said, Here is my Father glorified, that you do what? That you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciple. He's in fruit. If you are not, if your life is not bearing fruit, it means you are not his disciple. If your life is not bearing fruit, it means that you don't honor him. You don't bring glory to his name. If you are not bearing fruit, it means that you are not part of him because you are created in his image and in his likeness. And he gave you power and dominion and authority to go and subdue the earth. And he put everything that you need to reign, to subdue that earth. He put everything inside of you. You don't come back to him and tell him that uh, the reason why I did not bear fruit is because of X, Y, Z. He won't take that nonsense from anybody. You can complain for all that you care. That one demon or one people or whatever that is the one that is responsible. He is not going to listen to you. He has equipped you, give you the power and the authority and everything that no man can. You cannot stop what God had decreed. No one can change it. That is the reason why that man that was given one talent went and hid it. He didn't take nonsense from him. You can't give any reason, not one single reason. As why you are not shining so that men could see your good works and give glory to his name. You cannot. No excuse on planet Earth. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine. He didn't say that you have light. He said you are the light. So all you need to do is turn on the light. Turn the switch on the light of God. I'm going to show you something. When you begin to bear fruit. Hmm? The reward, the reward, you see, you're, you're rising. You're reigning in life. Your success, your breakthroughs, your open doors, whatever name you want to call it, is in bearing fruit. And the, the reward of bearing fruit are twofold. One has to do with this side of life. And on the other side, you also have a mind boggling reward. He said to Peter was writing in 2 Peter chapter 1 in verse 8. 2 Peter 1 8. He said, for if these things be in you and are bound, they make you that you shall neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see far off and had forgotten that he was purged from his own sin. Verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. In other words, make sure you bear fruits. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What is going to take you into that everlasting kingdom? of our Lord and Savior Jesus is because you bear fruits. You see the eternal reward. When you open this one again, it has dimensions. It has realms and dimensions. 
Now, in Mark chapter 10, verse 29, and Jesus said, and I said, and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that had left house or brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake and for the gospel. He said, Ye shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses, brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution. That is on this side of life, hundredfold. And he said, in the life to come, eternal life. In the world to come, you will have eternal life. So you have hundredfold on this life, and you have eternal life with God waiting for you. On both sides, you win. If your life produces fruits, and God has given you the ability, he has given you everything that you need to bear fruit. The seed. John chapter 4, verse uh, 36. He said, And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth what? Fruit unto life eternal. So you see, on both sides again, the one that is bearing fruit, you receive wages, you receive your reward here in this life and in the life to come. And he that repaired, received wages, and gathered fruit unto life eternal. You make deposit in the life to come. And you also make it. Life, you must bear fruit. There is no room for idleness. There is no room for laziness. There is no room for complaining. There is no need, no room for loitering around. Life, your life must be very productive. Because everything that you need to be productive and to excel in life, God has put them inside of you, inside of me. Not putting those things on, not putting them to work is your responsibility. That is why he said, walk out, walk out your salvation. Walk it out with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling in the sense that if you don't walk it out, if your life is not productive, the consequences is a lot. That is why Peter kept on saying, look at what Peter said. Go back to that second Peter chapter 1 verse 11. He said, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 12. He said, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of what these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. But I must continue to remind you because it is the most important thing about life. If your life is not producing, if your life is not bearing fruit, if you are not producing, the consequences is very bad. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance. Of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Verse 13. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to steer you up by putting you in remembrance. Watch 14. Knowing that shortly I must be put off this my tabernacle. That is going to die. Even as our Lord Jesus has shown me Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my disease to have these things always in what? In remembrance. Why is he saying this? Why was he emphasizing on this? So that you cannot afford not to bear fruit. Because if you don't bear fruit, entrance into the everlasting kingdom will not be ministered to you. A life that does not bear fruit is a wasted life. You don't represent God. You don't look like God. You don't have God's attribute and God's character. 
You are not his disciple. You are a disgrace to God because he said, this is how you bring glory to my name. So if you are not bringing glory, you are dishonoring him. Show me a man who is created by God. Who is complaining? You see, you see people who are loitering around. You see people who are living under the bridge. You see people who are. That is why you can never have one excuse before God when you stand before Him. You can't have one excuse if you like be living under the bridge. If you like, don't have a house. There is no reason. You know, what happened? I know where a lot of people are going to be pointing finger, but Satan now came and destroyed the seed that God has put in man. Any man that God has blessed, no man can unbless him. Satan cannot unbless you. Your father cannot remove it. Your mother cannot remove it. Your parents cannot remove it. Your teacher cannot remove it. The country where you live cannot, the government of the country where you, nobody but nobody can undo. If God has blessed you, nobody can say otherwise. And God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful. Numbers chapter 23, verse 1. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoke, spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by thy bond offering, and I will go. Peradventure the Lord will come to meet me, and whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to an high place. Verse 4. And God met Balaam and said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his bond sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable. That is, Balaam now, the prophet of God, now began to speak. And he took up his parable and said, Balak the king of Moab had brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God had not done what? And how shall I defy whom the Lord had not done what? You can't. If God said, and God blessed them, and God said, let them have dominion, and God blessed them, and said, be fruitful. No incantation, no enchantment, no divination by any man, by the queen of the coast, as you claim. No demon, no power has a right to curse someone that God has blessed. Get it into your head. In Proverbs 26, he said, curse, curseless. It cannot come. If God has blessed you, nobody has the right. The only person that has the right to curse you after God has cursed you or blessed you is the same God. Except God has not blessed you. Except he has not blessed you. Now, go ahead. How shall I curse? Okay. 
How shall I cause whom God had not caused? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord had not defied? Verse 9. For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoning among the nation. They are a peculiar, chosen, unique set of people. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let, him, let me die the death of the righteous, and let me be the last. And let my last be the end. And Balak said unto Balaam, the prophet, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse my enemies, and behold, thou hast done what? Bless them all too. In attempt to curse somebody that God has blessed, you will end up blessing him. If you are carrying God's blessing, no man, you see where, where, what our, our problem is? Ignorance is a disease, is a cancer, is cancerous. Except God has not blessed you. But I have read for you in Genesis 1, 28. And God said, let us make man in our image. And God created man in his image and likeness. And God blessed You sow seed, you didn't sow seed. Did you sow seed before he blessed you? No. Did you do anything before he gave you that dominion? No. Let's get the facts straight. Verse, verse 11. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord had put in my mouth? Give me verse 20. Verse 20 and 21. Behold, I have received a commandment to do what? To bless. And he had, and I can. He had not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither had he seen perverseness in Israel, the Lord his God is with him, and he and the shout of a king is among them. God is saying, Prophet, the prophet Balaam, the prophet of God. Balaam is one of the most powerful prophets in the Bible. That guy saw the invisible more than what Moses saw. He said the reason why he cannot curse, the reason why he cannot curse him, curse the children of Israel. You know the reason why? See the reason here. He said, he had not beheld iniquity in Jacob. He has not seen sin. Neither had he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. So you cannot. When God blessed Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and multiply and do all of that, did God curse him? Did God curse them afterwards? Did God curse Adam and Eve afterwards? Eh? You're not sure. Why did he curse them? Because of sin. That's what he's saying here in 21. I have not seen sin among the children of Israel, so I can't curse them. No matter what you do, after God has blessed them in Genesis chapter, in Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. And in verse 28, God said, and the Bible says, and in 28, he said, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply. God has done all that. Then in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 12, you know what happened? Verse 13, and God now began. 
And the Lord said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And then verse 14. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, you are what? Cursed above what? All cattle. And every beast of the field, upon thy belly shall thou, shall, uh, shall thou go, and thus shall thou eat all the days of your life. And 15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between the, thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head and he shall bruise his heel. Verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. That was a cause. Why did God do this? Because of the same person. That's why I said no other person can curse you when God has blessed you except God himself. And God can only curse you because you have broken his commandment. Verse 17. And unto Adam said, because, he said, because thou hast hearken unto thy, the voice of your wife, and has eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cost is the ground. He began. Because you have broken the cost. No other man, no other woman, nobody So, that's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verse 25, for all have done what? Now sin. And come short of what? The glory of God. So curse came upon man. Because of sin. It's because of Adam. Sin now came. You know why I'm saying this? You know why I'm doing this? I want, to, I want to solve your problem from the root. I love dealing with issues from the beginning. From the root. From the foundation. So you give it a permanent solution. So when Adam now sin, he put a curse on man. That curse ravaged mankind until Jesus Christ showed up. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, what did the Bible say? Christ had done what now? redeemed us from the cause of the law. For it is written, cause is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Verse 14. What happened now? That the blessing and God blessed them and said be fruitful. So God caused what he blessed as a result of sin. So Jesus Christ had now come pay the price of sin and restore us back to where? The blessing mode. This is the same reason why after this, you are now born again. Even those who are not born again will still go to eternal damnation. They will be punished because you, res you refuse to accept the salvation that God has offered to mankind. But you now that has received that salvation, you have now been turned onto the blessing mode again. You are now restored to blessing. That blessing that God blessed Adam, which he lost as a result of sin. And God will continue until the time of Jesus Christ to re restore everything. Now the prize has been paid. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, had redeemed us from the cause of the law so that the blessing will return. So what happens is that when you got born again, God forgave you all you are saying because he has punished that uh, disobedience in Christ. So, if you confess Jesus Christ and receive him as your Savior and as your Lord, your sins are remitted, are washed completely. 
not only that your sins are washed completely and all of that, what happens now, that blessing is restored. So, I am a blessed man from God. You cannot unbless me. The only thing that will now make that blessing not to work is what? Disobedient to God's commandment. Sin is what affects it. So you see where the concept of sin now comes in in regards to blessing. So that is why as long as somebody is living in disobedience, as long as somebody is living in sin, as long as somebody is misbehaving and you are pronouncing blessing upon that person, it's not going to work. Is that clear? It won't work. You will live in a house you didn't buy while you are living in disobedience. It's a lie. It will not work. The curse will continue. It will remain. Living a disobedient life, it will not work. The blessing will not function in your life. The one that comes from God. You know, last week, I was trying to, I said I was, because life is about fruitfulness. And so I was trying to deal with those things that make us not to bear fruits, that hinder fruitfulness, the potential that are in us. What I dealt with last week was about, on what? What was it that I dealt with? I said it's about overcoming the world. Because if you have not overcome the world, you can't be a fruit. I told you that overcoming Satan and overcoming the world, which one is harder? Is overcoming the world that is harder than overcoming Satan. That is why he said to you, come out from among them. Touch not the unclean things. Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. And he began to mention those things that are in the world. The loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the things that hinder you from bearing fruits. They are the things that are in the world. As long as they are there, you will be unproductive. You will be barren. You will not bear fruit. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. But this time around, this one again is about sin. Balak contracted Balaam to curse the children of Israel. Severally, he couldn't do it. And he came to verse 21 of that number, 23. He said, because God has not found iniquity with the children of Israel and Jacob. Their hands are clean. So, costless, cause that is costless, shall not do what? Proverbs 26, verse 2. As the bird, by wandering, as a swallow by flying, so the cause, causeless, shall not come. Anything you like, be do it. As long as my life is clean. Anything you like. You can go and mention my name in your deity. You can go and write my name and carry it and go and give one babalawo and do what. You know all those things they do. Your job, your job, your business, make sure you are clean. Your hands are clean. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Make sure your life is clean. Nobody. I will, have, I will not have sleepless. If I ever wake up in the night, if I ever open my mouth and say I want to pray, it's to kill that person. 
Not to say, uh, uh, I bind you, you cannot touch me. And uh, I won't do that. So that is why my, that is why you hear Paul said, he said, in this I exercise myself to make sure that I have a clear conscience towards God and towards men. My heart is clean. You can't touch me. That's why when I say you can't, there is nothing you can't do. The only thing that puts fear in my heart is if I have meddled with sin. If I have touched anything that is unclean. If I have broken God's commandment. Because if I break the hedge, serpent will come back. As long as I have not broken the hedge, no incantation against Jacob, no divination. Against Israel. No weapon designed against me shall prosper. And any tongue that rises against me in judgment. Condemning it is not, it's not that I condemn it. You know what it means to condemn? You condemn the person. I will condemn you. <laughs> I will condemn you. for touching God's anointed. That's why he warned, touch not God's anointed and do the prophet. In the, why they are touching God's prophet? Are they touching God's prophet and anointed today? And they are going to You know why? Because if the God's anointed and God's prophet have their hands soiled, shame. That's why when we talk about righteousness and holiness, <laughs> righteousness and holiness is the end thing. The thing they reign. Now the, now the thing where they reign now. How does Jesus Christ love the righteousness? He hated iniquity. His life was full of fruits. Fruitfulness. Anything that is not, you know, some of you, some, you know, when we tell Christians, when we talk, when they, whether you are a Yoruba, whether you are Igbo, whether you are Hausa, whether, go and read your Bible. You are the one looking for your trouble. That's why you hear me say time and time and time again, I am not a tribalistic man. I am not a tribalistic pastor. I don't believe in those things. Don't just come near me with it. I have no regard for it. A Christian is a Christian. A hidden is a hidden. And we cannot unequally yoked. So you cannot say, you cannot be the kind of a person that a Christian born again filled with the Holy Ghost and you call good bad and call bad good. You see something that is being done by somebody because, because the person is from your tribe. He's right. But if he's from another person's tribe, he's wrong. You are unrighteous. Your life can never amount to anything in the sight of God. That's why you don't bring politics in the church. Because Jesus is not a politician. He stood for righteousness. So let's go back to our fruit. Because I've talked about the world. Leave the world alone. Let the world leave you. Say like Peter, I mean like Paul, I have been crucified to the world and the world have been crucified unto me. You are free. Look at his life. You can't be a friend of the world and then you say you are going to be productive and effective and fruitful. It's a lie. Give me Luke chapter Give me Luke chapter 13 verse 6. 
he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and found, I found none. What did I, what did he said he should do to it? Do what? Cut it down. Any tree that doesn't bear fruit is not worthy to be a tree. It must be cut down. Why Kumbare eat the ground? Why are you suffering the ground and occupying space? The manure that other trees would have used and used to produce fruit, someone is consuming it and is bringing out nothing. Now, watch. An answering said unto him, Let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And then put manure. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt do what? Because the the end result of not bearing fruit, no matter how you manage the person, no matter how you do whatever, at the end of the day, if your life is not producing fruit, God will cut you down. He will reject you because you are not like him. You are not of him. You can't be his disciple. John chapter 15 verse 5. I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth what? Fought much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. He's talking about fruit here. Verse 7. If a man, okay, verse 6, he said, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and he is what? Withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. The consequences of not bearing fruit will be cut down. Your life does not mean anything before God. That's why I told you it's a serious case. It's a very serious matter. It is not something to play with. It's not something to joke with. That's why Paul, what Peter was writing. He said, I know that you are established in this present room, but he, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I have to make sure that these things I'm talking to you about, bearing fruit and all of that, stays inside of you, that you don't lose sight of it, that you don't forget it. I know I keep reminding you every day. He said that even after I am dead and gone, that these things will remain inside of you so that your life will continue to be productive. Fruitfulness. Because he himself knew that if at the end of the day he has gone to be with the Lord in heaven and you guys are not coming to join him, he will lose. He will not have any reward. So not just for himself, but also for his reward. Because bearing fruit carries you into everlasting life with God. Not bearing fruit, being fruit barren is a very serious consequence. It has a very serious consequence. God doesn't take it lightly. Mark chapter 11 verse 12. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Pay attention. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having what? Having what? Leaves. Underline it in your Bible. Having leaves. And I'm damn serious. Underline it. Having leaves. He came. If happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but what? Leaves. For the time of fig was not what? Yet. Underline it. For the time of fig was not yet. It was not the season. It was not the time for it to bear fruit. And Jesus said, answered and said unto it, No man eat of eat fruit of thee, Hereafter, for how long? And his disciples heard it because there was no fruit. Say forever, dry up, die. 
Did that tree die? Did it die? Now, the question where I want to draw your attention, why did Jesus Christ curse the tree when it is written that it was not yet the time for bearing fruit? It's not the season for fruit. Why did he curse it? Why did he curse the tree? It wasn't the season for fruitfulness, for the tree to bear fruit, because there are seasons. To everything there is a season. To everything there is a time. It's just like coming to look for mango on a mango tree during Hamatan. When it was not ready, it does not it's time for mango to bear fruit. So why did Jesus curse the tree? It is hypocrisy. I'm going to show you hypocrisy. Pretending to. Because those three, the Bible, that's what the Bible said. That tree had a lot of green leaves. Has so much activities. Because if you have those green leaves, there should be fruit in it. There should be fruit in it with the green leaves. You can't just have green leaves and be, go and check where you see fruit. Even in the early season, where the fruit, where the tree begin to blossom, the leaves and all of that, the next thing that you're going to begin to see, you see those uh, pollination flowers that are going to finally produce the fruit. You see them coming out. But this one was just green leaves everywhere. Not one single trace of fruit. Holier than thou. Pretending to be what you are not. That's why he called them hypocrites. They are like whitewashed up. Outside, they look so clean. Inside, very dirty. That is when he said, let nobody eat of you forever. Hypocrisy. Trying to impress some people. Eye service when you are not doing anything. He said, I will vomit you from my mouth. Barrenness is not good. God doesn't look at it. God doesn't take it lightly in any shape and form. You know this, you know some when we are talking, your mind is another place. When you finish it, don't worry. The, the first thing is that that is why this life you are living is dry. You are looking for where to go, where to borrow money, who to help you, where to get this, where to get. You keep begging. You are a borrower. You are a beggar. Meanwhile, you have the seed inside of you. Blessed. You are carrying the blessing. But you are a friend of the world. But you have all kinds of unforgiveness and all kinds of uh, offenses going on in your life. But you are full of stubborn, stubbornness inside of you. inside of you. You can't stay under if you are not on top. If you are not the one that is on top, nothing will happen. You will withdraw. Stop on me. You look at your life from the beginning to the end. No fruit, no productivity. You are not effective. God, you said the consequences of it is eternal destruction. Not only that in this life, you will be dry. You have nothing to show for it. You may be struggling or going to another whatever. You build and build and pack and pack. Before you know what is happening, one thing will happen or the other, and then the whole thing flee. You go back again to square one. 
the other time, I have mentioned to you the type of fruit that you must bear. There are three categories of fruit you must bear. It's a must. It is compulsory. Let's mention them and we'll take the first one. Even the first one, we'll not finish it. The first one, fruit you must bear, is spiritual fruit because life begins with the spirit. Life is powered by the spirit. Life begins in the spirit before it becomes natural. The first fruit is spiritual fruit. The second fruit you must bear is a fruit of good works. And the third fruit you must bear, the fruit of good works. If you read Colossians chapter 1 verse 10, you see where the Bible mentions good works. You, that you may be fruitful unto every good work. So you bear fruit. And the Bible also tells us in the book of, uh, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, bearing, being fruitful in every good work. We are going to be talking about good work. This aspect of good work is the one that is very personal. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ unto good works. You must bear this good work. If you don't have it, if you don't produce it, unto every good work, which God had before ordained that we may walk in them. That we may walk in them. That we may likely walk in them. That we may consider if we, if we can walk in them. That we may think whether we can walk in them. He said that you should. Should means it's compulsory. The third type of fruit. is precious fruit. You must bear it. <laughs> James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waited for what? The precious fruit of the earth and had long patient for it until he received the early and the latter rain precious fruit. You must bear it. And this one is the one that is general, common, everybody. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. It tells us, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Look at what he said. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us what? The word of... Who did he commit the word of reconciliation to? To everybody. So everybody must bear that fruit. So how many categories of fruit you must bear? Number one. Number two. Number three. So what are these spiritual fruits? What are these spiritual? That's the most important. That's where you begin. Some go and start from the any other one apart from it. Because the spiritual fruit now give us Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. See the one that you must bear first. But the fruit of the Spirit is uh, love, joy, peace, long suffering gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no... This is what makes you look like God. This is what makes you look like Jesus Christ. This is what makes you conform to the image of Christ. The very first requirement that God wants, God wants you to be like him. See, every fruit that God is asking you to bear is inside of you. 
Romans chapter 5 verse 5 tells us that God has shed his love abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So you have it inside of you. It is for that fruit to start producing. It's for that tree. That tree here is love. Love is the tree. That's why he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. Not the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit, single. The tree is love. It's been planted inside of you. It produces these other fruits. That love has been shared abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. You have it. It is meant left for you now to do what? To nurture and cultivate it. Fertilize it. Fertil to put fertilizer. Because you see, you, if you want to plant a seed and let it grow, what do you do? You plant the seed and then you put water and then you weed. Then the thing grows. It will receive sun. It will receive water and mineral. So, what do you do with the fruit of the... It's already inside of you. Cultivate it. Paul planted Apollos waters. The increase came. So, you must cultivate it. It's something that you're going to take one by one. The joy, the peace the patience that you need, long-suffering, the faithfulness you need, the self-control. The totality of the fruit of the Spirit, the totality of all the fruit of the Spirit is in this. There are three things that the fruit of the Spirit must produce. That is, if you are living a life of fruit of the Spirit, if you are producing the fruit, it is going to be seen in three ways, in three forms. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 9. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all what? Goodness and righteousness and truth. If you are producing the fruit of the Spirit, it is going to be seen in these three areas. All goodness. Everything that you do must be good. Good, goodness must be the watchword. Everything that you are offering, everything that you are doing, every service you are offering, every good that you are producing, every activity you get involved, anything that you get yourself involved must be pure. It must be good. You don't do shady things. You don't sell fake products. You don't sell inferior things. You can't, pro, you can't promise somebody to give him X, Y, Z and you end up giving him another. That's not good. That's the totality of all the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit must be seen in this area. That everything that you do, If you agree with somebody to give me a product or a service, you say this one is for 100,000 naira. There is one for 50,000. See it. He said, okay, I will pay for the one of 100,000. You collect 100,000 naira, put it inside your pocket, and then you offer the one of 50,000. That's bad. That's evil. You must be upright in the things you do. Must, your hands must be clean. So nobody can fault you. Like they tried with Daniel. They set him up, did everything. But the guy, they couldn't trap him. The guy, the guy was honest. The guy was clean. The guy was sincere. That's why the Bible says, if you want to be anyone that wants to take an office of a bishop, it must be found Blameless. That's where you go about to hear people say, even pastors, even preachers, and all of them, the sin is nobody is nobody is uh, perfect and all of And you are standing behind the pulpit. And the person that told you to, the person that said, put the law, said, if you are going, you must be above board. Your character must be pure, clean. It's written requirement. For standing behind the pulpit. 
But what, were, what are we hearing today? All kinds of the same thing. Really imagine me standing here and saying, nobody, me, I'm not perfect. Me, I'm not, I say have so many issues and all. Hey, leave the first Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Because some people are looking at me somehow. This is a true word. If a man desired the office of a bishop, he desired what? Have you seen a good work? Number two, the bishop must be a bishop must be a bishop may be blameless. A bishop is likely to be blameless. A bishop may choose to be blameless. A bishop may be thinking to be blameless. He says, a bishop must be blameless. It's written. That's why you don't call novice. The Bible says, if you read that, it says you don't bring novice into this because they are going to be ruined and destroyed. You don't bring novice. See the kind of scandals and the, the person must be, you know, and that's why I tell you, before God will bring you, before God will bring you to serve him, to represent, to be his mouthpiece, whether you are a prophet, whether you are a pastor, whether you are an apostle, whether you are an evangelist or a teacher, you know what he did with Moses. By the time we finished with Moses, Moses said he couldn't speak again. The one that, can, that could talk, and God, God was through with him. He said, God had to struggle with, at a point, God became now angry with him. He said, he said, he cannot, he said, he asked Moses, he said, who gave you mouth? Is it not me that gave you mouth to speak? How can you say you cannot speak? I have put my word, he, he said no. Because of the dealings of God in his life. Yeah, you see, you see, you see all manner of in the name of ministers. Full of pride and ego. Ego. Full of themselves. Full of everything apart from God. The character of the fruit of the Spirit, the character of Jesus Christ, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, they don't have it. They don't produce it. They don't. They hear the a big servant of God. Where chapter works. Have you seen a big servant of God? A great servant of God. So that's what we have everywhere. The same thing, if you go down, down when he talked about the dickiness, dickens and all of the same thing, they must be blameless. You cannot fault them. You are still doubting me, I should give you another one. In First Corinthians chapter 2. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from 12. He said, but we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And then verse 13, he said, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual does what? And he himself is. Can't judge me. I'm clean. He don't fault me in the public service, my private life. That's how, that's the standard. I don't know, it's beyond the scope of this meeting. I would have shown you 21 days, I mean, sorry, 21 years, God will deal with you before he will put you here. At least it's 21 years, he will walk on you. He will break you. He will clean you up. He will chisel you. He will refine you. So that, according to Malachi 3, so that you can offer sacrifices unto him in 
righteousness. So we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Holy Spirit is manifested in three ways or is shown in three ways. The first is in all goodness. That is in everything that you do. You can't be involved in anything that is bad. You cannot be connected with uh, <laughs> that your son supplied collected money to do contract and he ate the money. Is you. you. You resign. You step down. God is not a respect of any person. God does How old are you? How old? How, how old is the oldest man on earth? How old is the oldest man on earth? Guess. Yeah? Think. Maybe somebody, the person is uh, 1,000 years. Nobody had ever lived up to 1,000 years. How old is God? So how old is God? So you can intimidate him with your age. The Bible says he's not a respecter of any man. It doesn't matter who you are. You see, we have not yet known God until we get to there so that you begin to... Is, these are the things that when you hear, when you know, you begin to fear God, knowing that God is a consuming fire, that knowing the terror of God He's not a respecter of any person. He doesn't matter. He's the one that created you, gave you bread. Bread. It's just like what he said to Jeremiah. He said, before I had formed it, I knew it. Before you are conceived in your mother's womb, I have already done, ordained you and all of that and set you to do X, Y, Z. And then Jeremiah now came out of his mother's womb and is now grown and is now a big prophet that everybody now double for him and all of that. He feels that he can do whatever he wants to do and get away. Yeah. If you touch what he says, you should not touch. He will set you out. The second thing, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness. And what? The goodness is the things, the works of your hand, the things you get yourself involved and all of that, the things you do, good works. You cannot come to a place and say, it's only your church. If any other church comes here, you will kill them. You will set them up. It is unrighteous. Because such things, you can't say it in the open. It's an abhorrent for years to Righteousness must be the order. The things you do, the things you say, the way and manner you conduct your life. That's to show us, to show that you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit growing in you. The other one is truth. That's why you speak the truth. Truth must be found in your mouth. Irrespective of who is involved or who is not involved. If it is your wife that is at fault, you must stand up. You must condemn it. If it is your son, you must stand up. You must condemn it. Truth is a two-edged sword. It's not a respect of any person. If you do wrong, he will tell you this is the, is wrong. This one is right. You don't speak from both sides of the mouth. The fruit of us, the fruit of the spirit, is in all goodness, is unrighteousness, and truth. That's how we know. 
that you are living a life and the character of God. That's what you need to be godly. When you talk about godliness, that's what he's talking about. After the fruit of the Spirit, of course we know the fruit of righteousness now, which is incorporated here. So you see, they are all one in the same. First, Philippians 1.11 talks about the fruit of righteousness, which is by Jesus Christ. So the fruit of righteousness is by Christ. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is by the Holy Spirit. How do you cultivate the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is already in you? It's through fellowship with the person of the Holy Spirit. You worship, you praise, you sing, you offer thanksgiving, you study the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Because the Spirit has sword, so you study, you meditate, Confess. This is how you cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. How do you cultivate the fruit of righteousness? Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me, you will bear fruit. So it is knowing Jesus Christ. Righteousness has to do with the word of God is Righteousness. Studying the word of God and obedient, obedient to the word of God is righteousness. When God says this, you obey it. Every of his commandment is righteousness. So when you begin to obey the word of God, Jesus said, if you love me, Jesus, you must keep my commandment. When you keep my commandment, you are living a life of righteousness. Is that clear? The next fruit you bear apart from the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of righteousness, the next one is the fruit that is unto holiness. Romans chapter 6, verse 22, it talks about the fruit unto holiness, bearing fruit unto holiness. But now, being made free from sin and become servant of, to God, you have your fruit unto what? Holiness. And the end, everlasting life. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no eye shall see God. Because this one is what we're going to bring you to God. What is holiness? How do you bear the fruit of holiness now? Say, come out. Holiness is separation, separate from sin, separate from Satan separate from the world. Come out from the world. Touch not the unclean things that are in the world. Do not meddle with sin. Holiness is your heart. What you are thinking, what is going on in your heart. Is your heart defiled? Are you carrying unforgiveness? Are you carrying malice? Are you carrying gossip? and backbiting and all kinds of whatever that is, your heart is unclean, you are unholy. Touch not the unclean things and I will receive you. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. This is your body. There are things you must not put on this your body. There are things you must not wear. There are places that this your leg must not carry you to. There are things that this your hand must not touch. There are things you must not look. There are things you must not hear. There are things you must not eat. Daniel refused to eat it. And after all, I'm born again, nothing will happen. You sit down with them, they offer you, you eat. And you know these are the things, these are evil people, and all that they are doing are all evil. You sit down on the same table with them and eat their delicacies. Longer throat. 
He will kill you. They will give you money to entice you. Not all that glitters are. You must not receive every gift. Not every gift. Some of them are traps. You know, maybe it's tomorrow I'm going to... See, in this journey that we are in now, I beg you, and I'll be saying it, I beg you, I'm begging you. If you want me to kneel down, I'll kneel down for you. I'm begging every one of you. Spend time in prayer. (laughs) What is coming? What is coming? See, let me tell you something. I pray, I meditate on the things of God. I read my Bible. I hear from God. (laughs) And what I hear are not. See, when you hear about the beast, hmm? the beast, Antichrist, hmm? you've heard about Antichrist. His name is a beast. Okay? First of all, they are going to set up a system. They will set their systems. When they, that is why the Bible says, before that lawless man will be revealed, there is going to be what? Falling away. Before he will be revealed. Go and read it in First Thessalonians. I'm not making it up. He said before he will be revealed, there is going to be what? Great falling away. Why would and then in First uh, Timothy four, he talk about in the last days, many will depart from the faith. What what is what will make people depart from the great many of them? How is it going to happen? The beast system. They are putting their structures and their system and everything together. They are going to, he said, he is going to use many flatteries and he will deceive many. I know what you are thinking. You think you are smart. Let me ask you a question. Wait. Doing transfer money from your mobile phone hmm? and going to the bank to do the transaction, which one is better? Hmm? Which one is easier? Which one is more acceptable? Can you reject it? As I'm talking to you now, can you say no to it? Answer me now. Can you reject it and say that any transaction I will go to the bank? Hmm? That's how that guy is going to happen. Listen, I'm telling you, is what God was witnessing to me. Is how so that you know what we are up to. Where you think Satan, you think he's a, who do you think he is? You think he is a, I say when he comes, he's going to use what will appeal to you. Will look at it, you will say yes. AI, artificial intelligence, all those things they put them together trap, you fall into it. Just watch. That's why you must pray. (laughs) If you don't pray, if you refuse to pray, I've told you that prayer, I will pray, I've not had that, that whatever, I will pray, I will pray, I will pray, I will pray, if I don't pray, Antichrist and B system will swallow me up. Oh, I will pray, I will pray because of the B system. I will pray, oh, I will pray. If you don't pray, that guy will outsmart you. Many people will cheaply, easily, and the people that are going to buy into it are Christian, born again preachers. 
They will offer you into such a way you can't resist. Can you this see money? Even me, it's been a long, long, I hate going to the bar. Now, uh, GTB is not, uh, everybody is reacting. Uh, Zenith, I don't know what has come up. Oh, Jenny, Zenith, chaos everywhere. You are unsettled. Somebody was trying to transfer money. I have not seen it. Oh. He said, but I have sent it. He sent you the receipt. I, I, I have not seen a lot. Oh. You will be sending things. Like, I have got one the money. He said, wait, Nana. I said, what do you mean by wait? It's crisis. Network. <laughs> because you can't do without it. He will offer you something that you feel you cannot do without. Don't be getting ready. You see, before the guy will come, he will set up all this in place. The guy is just by the corner. He's waiting. He's planning everything, working it out. So when he will finally show up, when he comes up into the scene, what he's coming to do is to enforce it. If you don't buy it, I'll kill you. That's what he's going to do for that three and a half years. It's not that time he's going to start setting up. The thing is so big. So he sets all the system and machineries, put them in place. That's what they are doing. If you don't pray, if you don't pray, if you don't spend time in prayer, and I've told you, mainly majority, you see this isolated one man squad. This is your private prayer you are doing. It won't go far. Read this Bible. Read this Bible. You will not go far. Read the New Testament. You will not go far without your prayer. Individual. This, you know that your individualism. You won't, you won't go far. One of the reasons why you will not. See, Satan is going to be sending all kinds of. And because you are praying on your own, personal, you don't want to. You don't public prayer and all of that, you are not interested. You just want to be yourself and pray. He's go, he will know. And he will be sending different version of visions and dreams and all, concocted and all of that and be sending to you. And you will be buying them. And you believe it. Because if you carry those things and come in the public whatever and say it, you know that people, that's why the Bible said that we might comprehend with not only you, not one person, comprehend with the whole set. No man is an island. Especially this day that we are in. Many who are forsaking the assembling of the brethren, you are, they are going to pay, they, are, they will be the first to be deceived. Swept under their feet. Before they could say Jack Robinson, they are gone. The ones who say, ah, but this brother, how ah, about this sister, he prays, oh, he's very whatever. How come? Look at the jungle. When a lion want to finish any of those animals, you will isolate them. You will finish them. It's corporate. Corporate. How beautiful it is for brethren to stay together. Corporate. Corporate prayer. Corporate fellowship. Everything corporate. So we will fight together. I just mentioned the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of true holiness. There is still two more or three under the fruit, under the spiritual fruit you must bear. Fruit. We're going to, we're going to talk about good works. We're going to talk about the precious fruit. You must bear them. And I'm going to show you what good works is. The difference between your good works and the precious fruit of the earth. The precious fruit of the earth talks about souls. Everybody. Soul winning and discipleship. The two go to. They are two sides of the same coin. Which everybody must get involved. Then the good works is different. It's individual. You must get involved in it. So when the time comes, I'll be able to do that. But for now. So you find out that a lot of people, you look at the fruit of the Spirit. You look at righteousness. You look at holiness. 
look at the fruit of the spirit, fruit of the lips, which is thanksgiving, praise, worship. Just watch. When you have a corporate service, service is going on, prayer is being offered, worship and praises are going on, incense are going up. Some people are out. They single, they are out of it. You see blindness, eh? It, bulk, it, it, it blows my mind. I still could not. I, may God. In the house, in the assembly. You see, it's your kind, eh? Your kind. You can't go to heaven, no. They don't want to see your type in heaven because worship will be going on in heaven. You will leave. You will get up. To go and we we, or maybe you just you just remember there is somebody that you wanted to check whether he's also in heaven. You will leave the place of worship and go looking for the person. All sort of things will happen. They don't. The, heaven is orderly. That is why he said you must you must be found without spot, without wrinkle, without blame. Worship and prayer are being offered. And praise his all to God. If you don't, hi. This generation, eh? not to talk about people who come to church late. When the service is half gone, they just walk in. What are they doing? Nothing. They are the type, those five foolish virgins. They don't have, you can open here and walk in, no? But the doors, heaven is closed unto you. You come here and say you are you are coming is useless. You need to sit up. Not to talk about people who are sitting down there, and then somebody sends you a text, major text. You now do like this. One day. One day God will deal with you. You know, we don't, we don't respect, we don't honor God. We don't respect God. Is God your mate? Is he your mate? You don't fear God. There is what the Bible called the fear of God. He said, let my fear be your dread. Dread me. God is a consuming fire. Knowing therefore the terror of God. God is no respect of any person. When you come into the, go and read Ecclesiastes 5. When you come into the house, you behave yourself. If you have that, your phone, switch it off. And some of you have the audacity. The church service is going on. You bring out your phone, you are typing. You see that your hand. If care is not taken, let me not say. It is is very annoying. It is very. You can't disrespect God in my not in the church where I. You can do it any other place, but not in this church. I don't care. You can go. You can get up. Go. Don't come back again. Go and find another church. When you go there, when, do whatever you want, but not here. You can't do it under my watch. If I catch you, I will fall on you. If you don't like, go and start your own church. Build it and do whatever you want. But here, God must be honored. God must be re re revered. God must give the honor that is due to him. Just two, three hours. You can't discipline. When you talk about self-control, where is it? When you talk about the whole, the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Where is the goodness? Why, what are you? What you are doing? Is it good? Is it good? What you are doing? It's bad. It's evil. God will help us in Jesus' name. I said we will get there in Jesus' name. You are clean. Because of the word that you hear. If you don't hear the word of God, it can't be clear. Amen. Internet is open to everybody. 
any information you need now is just a, the distance between you and that information is just a button. You just punch it. Everything comes out. The good and the, uh, the good, the bad and the ugly, they are all there. You will swallow. And many people do not know how to see what they hear. They just carry everything like you and swallow it. And then you come up and say you are confused. That's my problem. That's why I talk about all these things. There are so many things. There are people who are condemned. They say this one is nonsense. He say uh, marriage is nonsense. Marriage, there's nothing like church wedding. There's nothing it doesn't taste. It's not in the Bible. It's not everywhere. And all. And they say when they begin to talk, they talk about eschatology. They talk about exegesis. And talk about where did you learn those? Who taught you? Is it not something somebody wrote? You are ignorant. You don't know God at all. There is a truth, the Bible said, that leads unto godliness. There is a truth that does not lead to godliness. There are two things. This is in the Bible. It might not be, you might not be this one, but we are looking for a representative, a representation. Or you want us to be eating there by every Thursday? <laughs> every Thursday we come here, we eat there. But on Friday we eat rice. On Saturday when we come for breakfast meeting, we will now take breakfast. That's what they want us to be doing. We just find something that is... You can use biscuits. And you use wine. It's bread and wine. And it is in the Bible. Jesus ordained it. It's in the gospel. It is in the epistle. You wake up and say it is idolatry. They say you should not baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit. That it is not in the Bible. Because the name of the Father is a title. The name of uh, the Son is a title. The Holy Ghost is a title. So what is the name of the Father? What is the name of the Son? What is the name of the Holy Ghost? So we see the argument. You see, sense. Please just go to that place in that Matthew 28. Tear it away so that we know it is not written there in the Bible. You see, this, you see, deception, lies, different form and shape. If you are not careful from your feet, you won't even know. The next thing that they will stop seeing you in the church. Uh, why haven't you been coming to church? Then my eyes don't open now. <laughs> he was blind before. <laughs> Just like somebody wake up here, he say, my eyes are sp- open. He say, some of the doctrines you are preaching, my eyes are open now. <laughs> so I'm leaving. On that very day, it and he broke it and gave them and said it this is my body that was broken by the same token he took the cup he lifted it up and he blessed it and said this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood as often as you eat and you drink it you do show the Lord's death till he comes he said to them I will not eat this with you again until I will meet you in my father's kingdom where we will celebrate and eat. Until then, we'll keep eating and drinking, remembering about his death, while we are looking forward to his coming. And if we are set, your mind is set at his coming, you purify yourself. You prepare and get yourself ready. Make sure that all the fruit of the, 
of the, the fruit that you are supposed to bear, the spiritual fruit, the fruit of good works, and the fruit of precious, the, the precious fruit of the earth, that you are all incorporated, you are guarding, and you are making sure each and every one of them is operating in your life. And we are praying that God will help us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. I am a child of God, and therefore I am not a slave to sin, death, fear, and faith. The power of God flows through me. The grace of God works in me. The power of God helps me daily. As I go out, I walk in victory and I am established in Christ as an oak of righteousness. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm.